So now we're going to talk about some problems related to nutrition with children. And just to get you warmed up, the first thing we're going to do is practice a question related to caloric requirements for infants. So calculate the appropriate daily kilocalorie requirement for a 10-month-old infant weighing 16 pounds. The answer that we've come up with here is 727 kilocalories. And the way that I obtained this answer is that first I converted the pounds into kilograms. So I took 16 pounds, divided that by 2.2 to get the total number of kilograms, which is 7.27 kilos. And as a general rule of thumb, if you remember infants, up until their early toddler, early first year of age, require about 100 calories, it will make the math or the numbers that might come at you at an exam more predictable. Specifically for a 10-month-old, the kilocalorie requirement is closer to 98 calories per kilo, and for infants under six months of age, it's more close to 108 calories per kilo. Once they get into the early toddler period, it jumps back up from 98 to about 102. So if you just remember 100 as a rule of thumb, that will help you with these calculations. The next question, the nurse is caring for a three-month-old infant who weighs 13.2 pounds. The physician has ordered 24 calorie formula with an intake goal of 648 calories per day. How many ounces of formula does the infant require in order to meet the daily goal? And the answer that we've come up with here would be 27 ounces. One thing you'll notice about this question, and you may find in other questions on the NCLEX exam or on your pediatric nursing exams, is there's a piece of information in the stem of this question that is not relevant to help you solve the question. And that would be the weight. The information provided for you, the caloric um, amount in the formula, which is 24 calories per ounce, and the goal of 648 calories per day. So all you need to solve this question is to take 648 calories, divide that by the 24 calories per ounce, and you will come up with the answer of 27 ounces as the goal for this infant. So now let's talk about failure to thrive. There are two types of failure to thrive, organic failure to thrive and non-organic failure to thrive. Organic failure to thrive is due to a medical cause. So this would be an infant who is not gaining and growing like they should because of, for instance, a cardiac defect where they're burning much more of the energy than they have through their formula or for, through their breastfeeding and they're losing weight and not growing and gaining from that condition. Other medical causes can, can cause organic failure to thrive. But the one that you'll talk about mostly would be non-organic failure to thrive. And this is considered a poor fit between the primary care caregiver, usually the mother, and the infant. So with non-organic failure to thrive, the clinical presentation you will find obviously an infant that is thin, that is weak, that does not look healthy, that looks uh, apathetic, they may not have a fear of strangers, and the radar gaze simply means that they're staring out, they're not engaging with anyone, so they're sort of detached. In essence, this poor fit between the mother and the child has caused the infant to withdraw, become apathetic, and less engaging than an infant would be expected to behave. So if we continue to discuss non-organic failure to thrive, or organic failure to thrive. The criteria would be that the infant, when plotted on the CDC growth chart, falls their weight underneath the fifth percentile. When you plot their height to weight ratio, you are likely to also find that that is below the 10th percentile. Risk factors, and now we're talking again about non-organic failure to thrive, would be poverty in the family, family stress, different health beliefs in the family, particularly around the types of diet that they would provide the child, and then insufficient breast uh, milk, baby formula, or even the preparation of the formula. Sometimes when you go and you do an assessment with a family where there's an infant that's not gaining weight like they should, 
you would ask the family, how do you prepare formula for the baby? Show me how you do it and have them take the formula, the powdered formula, if that's what they have in the home, and show you how they would create a bottle. And in some cases you will find that the family has been diluting the formula to try and make it last longer to save money, not realizing that by doing so they are diminishing the caloric density of the formula per ounce, thereby not giving the child enough calories. So what interventions can you do with a family of an infant that has non-organic failure to thrive? Well, you can do family visitation, especially if you're a public health nurse working out in the community, and you can see how the family interacts. You might find on a home visit that you go in and you see a mother with a newborn child and two to three other young children running amok in the house, toys strewn everywhere, very loud, noisy, chaotic household. That is not uncommon. What you want to advise this family in that case is that the mother and the infant or the pri primary caregiver, if it is a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle, that they need to find a nice quiet place where they can feed the infant free from distraction so that the two of them can focus on bonding and getting the infant the calories that they need. Providing maximal calories is important. These infants usually when you provide in for intervention and educate the family on how to properly provide nutrients to the child, you do not need to give an extra dense calorie formula. If an infant is taken from a home and brought to the hospital for failure to thrive, usually within under a week the infant starts showing a pattern of gaining weight so quickly that they are able to be discharged home and do not need a high calorie formula. Feeding in a structured way is important, so we want to again have a nice quiet place for meal times for feedings. Maintaining eye contact, holding the infant in that on-face position, not feeding the infant from afar while they're sitting in a baby seat, that is also very important. It helps promote bonding and helps the, the parent and the child understand each other's cues and learn more about what it means when the baby's crying, does it mean that they're hungry, does it mean that they're wet, just helping them communicate better by having that closeness. Involving social services is critical, especially if this child is going to be followed um, on an outpatient basis. Maybe a public health nurse can be asked to come and provide some visitation where they can weigh the child on a weekly basis and make sure that that pattern of gaining and growing continues in the direction we would like it to go. Role modeling caregiving skills is of primary importance when the child has been hospitalized. Oftentimes you will find that the caregivers are embarrassed that the child has been taken from the home, that there may be child protective services, family services involved because people are concerned about the weight that the child has not gained since birth. And so for that reason, often the family will defer to the nursing staff to provide all of the caregiving for the infant because they feel inadequate as a care provider. So what you really want to do as the nurse is you want to have the family, have the mother hold the child, feed the child. Do not ask them, would you like me to feed the child? Because likely they will say, yes, why don't you go ahead and do it? What you'd rather have is say, here, I'll bring a bottle for you. Now, why don't you go ahead and feed the baby and I'll watch while you do it? And as the mother or the caregiver is holding the infant, you can say, now, do you see how he looks at you? He really likes looking at your face or you can tell them other things that will build their self-esteem and their confidence and help them understand the child's cues. Do you notice how the baby is now kind of turning their head to the side or closing their mouth or they're playing with the nipple of the bottle and they're not really sucking? That's cues that the infant is done feeding. So why don't we stop now? You can provide lots of uh, role modeling behaviors but you definitely want to put the care in the hands of these providers at home. So we have a question now. Which of the following is the best recommendation for the mother of an infant with non-organic failure to thrive? Feed the child every three to four hours around the clock. Provide free water in hot weather. Attempt to bottle feed for at least 45 minutes. Or provide a consistent, calm environment for feedings. And the best answer for this question would be to provide a consistent, calm environment for feedings. Again, we want to promote as much bonding and communication between that primary caregiver and the infant as possible. Feeding the child on a strict schedule, in essence, ignores the child's own cues. When someone asks you, how much should my baby eat, or when, how often should they eat, the best answer would be whenever the baby is hungry. The baby will set their own schedule. 
Obviously, you would want to not let the child go for a long period, more than five or six hours, but if the child is at the age where they're starting to sleep through the night, that might be a period where you could let them go. And then during the daytime, when the child expresses any type of hunger symptoms, you definitely want to jump in with a bottle. You would not want to try and bottle feed for at least 45 minutes. Doing that, you can picture the caregiver would say, ah, I got to get this done in 45 minutes. So even if the child after 20 minutes has taken all of the bottle and I'm starting at a second bottle and they're giving me symptoms that they're full, I'm supposed to do it for 45 minutes so I need to keep on pushing it. And again, that's ignoring the child's cues, which we don't want. Extra water is not providing the calories that the child needs, so we wouldn't want to do that either.